Drake Music Logo Callum Perrin Pepper Harrow Ian Story Content Warning This piece is about mental health and contains a description of a suicide attempt. Audio Description Introduction This film shows three musicians in a studio setting playing the music we hear, interspersed with scenes and photographs illustrating the protagonist Ian's story. Playing the cello is a white woman in her 20s with shoulder-length blonde hair, loosely tied back with a scrunchie. She wears a light-coloured plaid shirt with ruffled sleeves. On clarinet, a second woman has her long, dark hair tied up in a bun and wears gold wireframe glasses. She also appears to be in her 20s and wears a black t-shirt with a white, super-dry logo on it. Finally, there's the pianist, although we only see her fleetingly. Mostly, we see close-ups of her hands at the piano in the afternoon sunlight. She wears a long-sleeved check shirt with the cuffs of the sleeves unbuttoned and jeans. Interspersed and sometimes split-screened with this footage of the musicians are vintage photos and videos in black and white and colour, as well as nature scenes and more abstract footage. In a series of black and white photos, we see what is ostensibly Ian, the man being interviewed on the soundtrack. He's slim, white and clean-shaven and appears as a young adult. He has freckles and wavy, light, possibly ginger hair, parted in the middle and worn shoulder length, a bushy mane that frames his head. Several of the photos show Ian playing acoustic guitar. Another shows him wearing a tie-dye t-shirt with a cigarette hanging from his lips. His expression is pensive or wary. Only towards the end of the film do we see a couple of snapshots of him smiling, in one of which he has grown a beard. Also featured in the visuals are stills and footage of the institution at Pepper Harrow. Georgian in style, it's a grand, squarish building constructed of yellow brick with stone details, including a balustrade along the rooftop and a two-story columned portico. Surrounding the mansion are a grassy lawn, playing fields, and garden allotments. Shown at various seasons, groups of young people play football on the lawn, do the washing up, work in the garden, play and perform music, and attend group meetings sat on folding chairs. They, like Ian, appear as young adults, and they include a mix of men and women. Other visual motifs that we see through the film, particularly at points where the story travels, are views of a woods in autumn and a repeated shot of someone walking, looking down at the ground from their point of view as they stride along a sidewalk strewn with leaves. Additional footage shows busy city streets and empty alleyways, and when Ian talks about his time in a psychiatric hospital, a view out the back of a train fading to black as the train travels deep into a tunnel. My name is Ian Lynn. I'm 64 and I come from the northeast of England. I went to Pepper Harrow in April 1974. I grew up in a frightening house. There was a high level of fear for quite a lot of the time in the house and I did everything I possibly could. Try not to cause a a huge row or a a fight or just draw attention to myself. I was extremely unhappy. I first attempted suicide when I was about 16. There'd been a huge row in the house that night and and I I still didn't know why. You know, my mother was extremely angry and it was was horrible. I I went to bed and I kind of felt that I, I didn't really want to do this anymore. So I, I, I took a handful of tablets, of my tablets, sleeping tablets. And I woke up the next morning and I went to school. I must have looked pretty out of it because my, my friends, uh, they looked at me and said, are you all right? <laughs> so I, I kind of explained to them what had happened. I don't really remember much after that, but I, uh, uh, I did end up um, in hospital. And I was there for, uh, for four months. It 
was a psychiatric hospital in the centre of Durham. I had a room overlooking the viaduct, which actually was rather lovely. Um, I do remember one standing at the window one night and watching trains go past and the snow falling on the viaduct and it was rather beautiful. I went in taking 15 milligrams or whatever, the, whatever drug it was at the time. Uh, and within about three or four weeks, I was on 150 milligrams. So 10 times a dose and it was having no effect really. End of February, 74 there was going to be a case conference and they were going to decide what happens to me now. Because I was quite worried about leaving hospital and going back to living at home and stuff, and I think they were too. But before the meeting got underway, my social worker gave me a piece of paper and I looked at it and it had English O level one. And he had to explain to me, he said, well, that, you, you got the highest grade for English that it's possible to get. And, and he shared that with the other people sitting around and, you know, they said, well, we, we've got to find somewhere for you to go because you're, you're clearly very intelligent. So somebody mentioned this place called Pepaharo. They said it was, it was a therapeutic community and um, it was a place where they thought it could really help. So I was dispatched for an interview at Pepper Harrow. I had to get the train all the way down to London. And the, the thing was that the person who accompanied me was my stepfather, which kind of wasn't ideal. I was presented with this fabulous Georgian mansion. It looked amazing and slightly intimidating too. We walked in and immediately it was clear that this is very different on the inside than it was to the outside. It was pretty run down. The kids who were there, I'd seen nothing like it. A lot of them had like really long hair, the kind of length of hair that would not have been tolerated by my school or indeed my parents. A lot of them were smoking openly in front of staff. And all these, these kind of hippie, hippie guys going around, you know, no shoes and socks on. And, where am I, you know? And then we sat down in the old library and we had an interview. And, and that's the first time I met Melvin Rose, who was the director of, of Pepper Harrow. I was terrified. <laughs> so after 40 minutes of, of discussion, searching questions, trying to find out how aware I was of my own situation, they ended up offering me a place at Pepper Harrow, which I, I probably refused because I thought my stepfather would, would, would disapprove of it. And then we talked about it on the train back, and to his credit, he did suggest that they could offer a lot of ways for you to try to get yourself together. Anyway, over a course of a few days, I changed my mind and contacted them. And they said, we'll see you on the 27th of April. Pepaharo was intimidating because it was so different. But there were people around who were very kind. There were, there were some who weren't so kind and they acted out in different ways. There were others who were like me who were uh, more depressive. Pepaharo was a community in the truest sense. Everybody was, was working for the betterment of the community and working and we were working for each other. Every day there was a rotor and there were th three or four kids whose job was to go around and, and spend an hour vacuum cleaning floors, eating bins, that kind of stuff. You, you were actually really involved in caring for each other. There was a meeting every morning, Monday to Friday, in the gold room, which was a huge room with a beautiful ceiling, picked up gold. 
get to 50 or 60 people. And it's where the community discussed things about people, how things have gone, if somebody had caused a problem the day before, if somebody was obviously in, in difficulties. And it was, it was that kind of sharing thing which I think really made a big difference because people started to talk about things that I recognised. And I thought, okay, so maybe I'm not completely alone here. And then every week there was a, a more intensive group in a, in a small room downstairs in the basement. There was fewer places to hide because instead of there being 60 people in the room, there were, you know, eight or nine of you. Every boy who went to Pepper Harrow was given what we called a guru. It was a single member of staff, which in my case was a, a smashing guy called Bob, who was responsible for you. And they probably knew you best of anyone. You also had sessions with them, or one-to-one -one sessions every week, where you'd sit down and you'd talk, and it was much more personal, much more uh, in intense. A few kids refused to work with up, and they, they never lasted long. They left, you know, because they couldn't cope with the, uh, with the pressure, if you like. didn't seek to treat you for your behaviour. It sought to explore the reasons. And once you understood the reasons for your behaviour, you kind of didn't behave like that anymore. And I was there for five years. By the end of my second year there, I was starting to feel a bit more confident. I was starting to see a pathway ahead. I knew I still had an awful lot of things to work through and I was still unhappy about a lot of things. But I was kind of part of a community and I could sense that the, there were structures there around me which would enable me to grow and ultimately leave and, and you know, with, a, with a good chance of, uh, of being okay. Credits, Callum Perrin, composer, producer, bass, and singer. Sophie Sparks, piano and co-composer. Charlotte Bartley, clarinet. Laura Armstrong, cello, recorded at Crown Lane Studio, supported by an ascendant commission from Drake Music Collective. Drake Music Collective is generously supported by PRS Foundation, Help Musicians UK, Esme Fairburn Foundation, David Family Foundation, Doily Cart Charitable Trust, Fenton Arts Trust, Harold Hyam Wingate Foundation, Idlewild Trust, and Leach Trust.